big corporate companies, you know, their value to the economy of Hawaii is valued at well over a million dollars a day to our island economy. Yeah, to the states, 370 million. That's why, that's what they bring. But guess what? What they grow, we don't eat. What they grow does not stay here. They ship it out and turn around and make billions. The other companies that also use these pesticides, herbicides, Roundup, Atrazine, yeah, daily spraying, polluting our land, causing drift in the air that can, can be harmful to our senior citizens or kupuna who are already struggling to breathe, you know, breathing on ventilators and then they gotta inhale that drift or chemical drift. And then these guys are located right across the streets from our schools, elementary schools, and then we gotta worry about our keiki. And then looking in the community and seeing all of this questionable uh, medical illnesses. Yeah. Our people are expendable because they bring in millions to our state's economy. Yeah, first of all, um, you know, the main concern for me in regards to GMOs is not really a question of GMOs, first of all. I think the main question, of course, is the agribusiness uh, as it's being run on Maui and in Hawaii in general. Um, and if you understand how GMO farming is done and uh, what, what happens to our, 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 our aina and our resources, then you realize the huge impact and the huge negative impact it's already, not may have, in Hawaii but is already having in Hawaii. And so, and that's because this particular kind of farming depends a lot on chemicals. First of all, chemicals to kill off any kind of life forms, or any kind of uh, weeds that may be growing in, in the fields. And secondly, any kind of pesticides that might go in there to also kill off any kind of microorganisms or, or bugs that may be part of the soil which be killed by these um, uh, insecticides. And so that in itself should worry people in that uh, these kinds of farming, as I understand it, you know, in some fields, as much as 75 different types of chemicals are being sprayed into the, the soil, onto the plants, uh, and into the fields in, in different manners. Um, and as I understand, you know, even just as a little as 10 types of chemicals already should be very, very worrisome, that we should already be uh, uh, wondering what the effects are. Unfortunately, you know, as we understand it, the, the effects can be and may be uh, irreversible. And so we as people of this land should first of all learn as much about this type of farming, uh, especially what the harmful effects may be. And the truth of the matter in Hawaii, this kind of farming is going on really under our noses where for most of our people, we really don't know what's really happening. We really don't know at all what the long-term effects are. But factually, you know, the red flag for me, of course, factually, if you were to look around the world and you realize around the world, this type of farming, this type of pesticides and insecticides are banned. And obviously, if other countries are banning these pesticides and insecticides, they're probably banning for some kind of scientific basis or some kind of reason. Now, what are those reasons? And see, that's part of our own education as a community for, for health and safety. We gotta first of all understand what those negative effects may be. I know from personal experiences, my mother um, got asthma from when they sprayed pesticides across the courtyard at her school that she went to, um, Kaunakakai Elementary. And a lot of her classmates got asthma too, so, I know it hasn't been tested enough, but there's enough testimonies and enough people that got affected by it to know that it is hazardous. And because we don't know enough about the benefits or the health dangers of what, mon or what GMOs is doing and what the pesticides are doing, 
I don't think it's safe yet until we have more information about this topic that they're using with our food products. To me, that, that's the biggest, most important issue that's going on out there is whether or not what is, what's happening to our aina out there, whether or not that is good for our people. And I can find no evidence, in fact, that it's actually good for our people. But on the opposite end, I can find a lot of red flags, which is telling me we should be heavily, heavily concerned about these chemicals that are in the land, which get its, gets into our food, which of course which gets into our water system, which gets into our air, which then get, gets into our children, which gets into all the life forms that, that, that are here in Hawaii. So it, it's, again, it's bigger than a political question. To me, it is a question of intelligence, very simply. It's a question of being intelligent. It's a question of being someone who really feels to be a, a, a real steward of this place and not someone that's just quickly trying to capitalize off of the resources. In the late 70s, early 80s, uh, I hosted some of these farmers that came out to Maui in the early stages of seed corn production on Maui. Uh, Trojan seed corn, triple X, decal seed, Pfizer genetics. Uh, these were some of the names of seed corns. And so these guys, when I first met them, they shared with me how, how valuable the production of seeds were in Maui for them as farmers in Nebraska. In one year, they could get anywhere from three to three and a half crops in Maui in one year. It would take them three and a half years to acquire that seed. And so they would come uh, after their harvest season, come during the winter and start farming seeds. And, and I think back then, for me, I was innocent about, innocent about understanding the value of that seed. A lot of them came because they wanted to grow uh, popcorn. You know, some of their fathers had contracts to produce popcorn for this guy called uh, Orville uh, Redenbacher or whatever, yeah? And so all they did was grew short corn with a lot of uh, seeds for popcorn. Then the other guys, they just wanted to grow silage. So they just wanted to produce uh, corn stalks that was like 15 feet tall, you know? And they just wanted to produce that seed that could produce that corn stalk. And I was accepting of it, you know? I said, oh wow, that's cool. You know, you're growing your food, yeah? What your needs are. They wanted to have silage for their animals. They wanted to have popcorn. A long ways of farming has come from the 70s to now, yeah? Seeds have now come to where the, the genetics and the scientists have been playing on with different things and, and now they go counter to what nature has created. What is natural? Yeah. What is the practice in nature? Now they go in a lab and they take something from a, a rat or a frog and introduce it to a plant and create something. Now, you're moving away from that, that sacredness of seed production. If it wasn't, you know, of nature, if it wasn't Mother Earth or Keakua and all that kind of stuff, then it shouldn't really be here because if there was a need for it, it would have happened already. It would have been here with us. It's no surprise to me that Hawaii is also, you know, as has been said, you know, this is the capital of this kind of open uh, open field testing, you know, uh, and so when you look at a place like Hawaii and people talk about the beauty of Hawaii and the value of Hawaii, to even consider and to look in the history to understand the amount of food that once was produced here, you know, when you think about the question of food sovereignty or the question of our people being able to feed ourselves, um, it's no, it's, it's not, um, it's not, surprising that it's happening here. You know, one of the reasons it's happening here is the same reason I think we have those kinds of 
uh, other industries that are here also in Hawaii? With Kamehameha Schools, um, leasing land with Monsanto, I feel like that it's different from the, it's not the same as the campuses, like our school and the company of Kamehameha Schools, because they're, they're really two different things. There's the company side and the school side. And it's the company side that chose to lease out that land. And personally, I don't think that that was a right decision, that maybe it was money. I don't know. But we, that's a whole lot of land that they leased out. And we don't want that land to be taken away from us. I think that that is a great piece of land for some local farming. We could totally take that opportunity to have all of our local farmers come in and farm some organic foods that we know are safe for us, for our consumption. And if Monsanto can stays there, I fear that that land will be barren and that we will not be able to use that land again and it'll be a waste. So I'm just concerned that after Monsanto leaves or if they do, that we won't have anything left there. And then that would just be, I think that would be the worst possible situation because then it was for nothing. You know, and I think what's going on right now in Hawaii is that we're not, first of all, informed. And second of all, we're not giving our free consent in all of this. Yeah, Free and informed consent, I think, is a, is a necessary piece of, of, of understanding where we're going to head into the future. So the first question, are we informed? You know, as we have, as a community, are we informed of exactly what's going on? What are those chemicals? What are the harmful effects when those chemicals are combined? You know, are we giving our consent? Who is giving consent? How is consent being given? And first of all, the idea of it being free. You know, is this something where our government is actually investigating, researching, and finding all the facts to give us the, the best information so we can give our free consent? Or is it just more of the same where these huge multinational corporations, uh, they're doing their own research, and then they themselves are um, unchallenged by the research? If our government, our local government here on Maui, can only use some hindsight and taking some recent history uh, in the late 70s, in the 70s, uh, some of the agribusiness plantations had uh, sprayed down DDT and uh, you know these um, DDT liquids were sprayed on, on our soil and it and it killed our soil it even leached through our soil it leached so far down that it was able to taint our water source and so even our some of the current council members that sit on the council had to deal with that decision of is that water well safe for public consumption and they know the answer and what was that that was 30 40 plus years ago that effect yeah now you come forward the kinds of pesticides and chemicals that are within the herbicides and then you're multiplying the uses spraying it onto our soil in Hawaii you know we get kuleana well pesticides skull and crossbones uh, number one obviously not healthy to ingest digest breathe you know inhale whatever um, I think or any kind of contact with skin so pesticides in its own form uh, needs to be dealt with uh, you know with caution uh, of course there's pesticides that can be used in the proper manner for good but I think the way it's being infused into again a living organism for me is quite disturbing and I'm not a scientist but it's just not natural <laughs> it was about 50 years ago that this gentleman came up with a speech called, I have a dream. Yeah. And in that speech, he addressed the issues of segregation. Yeah. Back then it was the issues of color. Yeah. 
what was black, what was white. This issue with this moratorium is also about segregation. Yeah. Sometimes it's about corporate America and agribusinesses that come to our islands and throw money on us and our people. What is the value of our land? What is the value of allowing our land to be poisoned? What is the value of allowing our water to be tainted? Yeah. And so the segregation becomes the rich and the poor or those who can afford, those who cannot afford. Yeah, there's still an issue of segregation. And the call back then was for the people to come together, the people to come together and unite and stand up for what is right. Yeah. This great individual I recognize as a servant leader, yeah, named Martin Luther King Jr. And I flash back on that, and I flash back to today, and it's no different, you know. The importance of understanding the urgency of now. And so there is an urgency um, that if we truly want to be Hawaiian, if we truly want to protect this place, if we truly find that this is where, as we say, you know, we say to Hawaiians, wherever I walk upon these lands, wherever I walk upon, I virtually walk upon the Eevee. You know, the bones of my ancestors are everywhere in this land. So virtually, we plant within our kupuna. What is happening to the land, literally, is happening to our kupuna. It's literally going to happen to us. It's literally going to happen to the next generation. As what I said between Hawaiians and non-Hawaiians living in Hawaii. You know, if you're going to live in Hawaii, your bones and my bones will end up in the same place. And your children's and grandchildren's Eevee will all end up in the same place also. So in the end, this question of the present really is not the question to be asking. The question of the future is the question we need to be asking. Because eventually, if we all end up in the same place, we all end up with the same future. So this is a future that we all should be concerned about. You know, ka'ea, ke'ea, o ka'aina. You know, what does it mean, ke'ea o ka'aina? It doesn't say ke'ea of that document, of that king, that queen, of that government. It's the land itself. So if we only have one core political responsibility or economic responsibility or culture responsibility or social responsibility is to worry about the health, the vitality, and the power of the land. why I felt that this was important from a Hawaiian perspective, it, it connects me to the motto of Hawaii'ine. Yeah, I've mentioned this before. Ua mau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono. Now we all speak about that idea, ua mau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono. Ua mau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono. Ua mau ke ea, yeah, forever, continued. Kea o kaaina. This is, a, I think, it's a very important critical idea. Kea o kaaina. The word ea, you know, sovereignty, independence, the political power. But really, what he's talking about is the right to rule or life itself. That which is life itself of the of the land, of the land, o kaaina and land aina. That which feeds us. That which brings us life. Ikapono, you know, in in harmony, in balance, in virtue. So, again, when you look in in Hawaiian political thought. The eo kaina is really the most important element in our uh, identity as people of this land. That if we, have, if we have one duty, if we have one duty, one responsibility, the one kuleana that was given to us, the lesson you know, that was simply given to us, is that, you know, ask that question, is, what hap is what's going on right now in these fields, is it, is it eo o kaina? Is it Pono? And if it's not, or more specifically, if we don't know, we better know. See, that's our kuleana to take on. This is not something we can leave on to the next generation because it might be too late for the next generation. I feel that GMO should be, a, or is a Hawaiian issue, 
because it deals on our soil and on Hawaiian land, or if, not, if it's not our land now, it was our land back in our history. And that's something that we as Hawaiians, we were farmers, a lot of us were farmers. And just to see that land corrode away and um, kind of slip out of our fingers is, um, I guess that's kind of culturally, that impacts a lot of us because then we, there's a lot of history that goes on there. And we're gonna lose the soil, we're gonna strip, the, they're gonna strip, strip the nutrients from what's going on, then we can't plant anymore. And that's kind of a big issue here in an island and in a state that used to be built upon farming. I understand the huge amount of value and resources that were placed in the land. The land, as we say in Hawaiian, uh, the, 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 um, through our Mele Aipohaku, a song of, of resistance, Kalona Napua, is this idea, the wondrous food of the land, the rocks, the aipohaku, the land, the, the land is what feeds us, the land is what nourishes us, the land is our identity, who we are as a people. And so, poisoning of the land, in a sense, is really about poisoning our people. You know, poisoning the earth is a reflection of poisoning our own selves. Relating to Hawaiians, for me, is looking back at how my ancestors um, farmed. What was the Hawaiians' uh, connection to the land, to the water, to the air, to the sea, to the other living forms and animals, whether it's a plant, whether it's even a pohaku, a stone. Everything physical, material, had a relationship to the Hawaiian people in a certain way. And that the pure and more natural the form is what the, I believe, you know, the Hawaiians are my ancestors um, praised and had deep respect for. So to think that something is genetically modified goes against all philosophy and the thought process of honoring um, a living organism for me is what's very disturbing about this practice. And so it's just, you know when you look at the Hawaiian question you know whether you're looking at demilitarization or you're looking into protection of sacred sites or the protection of our lands or the revival of our language or our cultural uh, identity or education you know this comes along right hand in there you know health health of the people is at the forefront that should always be at the forefront in Hawaii we have a saying kapu keola yakane or kapu keola nakane which means life is sacred to the god kane what it means is that you know life isn't cheap life isn't something you should just quickly toss on the side that the most important cultural value for Hawaiian people the most important cultural value is life and so life should not be seen as being cheap Life should be seen as something that we need to protect and something we need to um, uh, progress to a people to become a healthy people. And there's no way, I think, knowing what I know or not knowing you know, what's happening, I can see us moving forward in this current situation. So the current situation for Hawaiians demands that we become subjective, we become um, uh, proactive in our future. And proactive means we want to be informed. Proactive means that we want the choice to decide for ourselves what's good for us and not be reactive in having others decide for ourselves. You know, so for someone who believes in self-determination for my people, it goes hand in hand with self-determination. What best way uh, to uh, enact self-determination than to care about the health of your children, to care about what they eat, to care about the environment where they, where they play, uh, care about where they swim, care about what water they drink, you know, what are all those impacts. And so, uh, you know, quickly for me, as a political act, as a proactive act, um, this question of GMO farming to me or crop raising uh, is one which is uh, really smack dab in the middle of the question of Hawaiian self-determination. And I think self-determination for all people who choose to live in Hawaii, because uh, I don't believe anybody wants to live in a place which is being poisoned. I think all people want to live in a place in which their children and grandchildren will be living in a very healthy environment. And so it's not really just a Hawaiian issue, although I think it's a core Hawaiian issue, but I think for anybody who lives in Hawaii, it's an issue that they all should be concerned about. Those who are spraying 
they too have families that live here. And then I look at them and I kind of question like, that's the gift you're going to give your grandchildren or great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren? The gift is you're going to give them dead soil, dead dirt, dead aina. You're going to give them polluted water that they no longer can drink because you sprayed it, you tainted it with atrazine and, and Roundup. And you turn an eye because it's a job and it's bringing money. So now we, you know, separate ourselves because of money and allowing our future or the children to say, I'm giving you polluted water to drink and I'm giving you dead soil to grow on. That's my gift to you. Good luck. I don't think that is porno. So as, as a Hawaiian person, you know, as a Hawaiian person, my kuleana, my duty as a person here in these islands is first of all, is to be a great steward of this place. And being a good steward of this place is the process of making sure or guaranteeing whatever you leave on to the next generation and the generations to come is in better condition than when you or all of us here have received it from the previous one. Unfortunately, we cannot say that. Unfortunately, there's no way we can guarantee that what we're living on or we're, pre we're presenting to the next generation is actually any better. In fact, if you look at the facts, just by the fact of the pesticides and insecticides, the kind of killing that's going on within the soil, just that alone tells you that the quality of the soil is not being improved, but the quality of the soil, in fact, is being damaged. And that in of itself, my point is, you know, that, that should be a huge red flag in regards to what are we leaving the next generation. You know, I flash back to all the kids that I, I worked with that are now, what, 20 years, 30 years, 40 year olds. And, and when they were young, the common cry was, Malama Aina, yeah? Malama Aina, to take care of this land. Malama Kahonua to take care of this earth. And yet we turn a blind eye on hindsight of this poison that has killed our soil, killed our land, our aina, has killed our honua, honua to the point where it affects our water, to where, I don't know, if our people can even drink it. And so now we stay today, they're still doing it. Yeah. As Hawaiians, we cannot turn a blind eye on that. Yeah. If it ain't good, then stop. As a moratorium, first of all, I think it's a, that's a real important step. It's a real good step. You know, it's not a general ban. It doesn't say forever. As a moratorium, it's basically, say, wait, wait, let's put little breaks onto this. Understand what's happening first. Before we take a second and third step, let's take this uh, initial step to find out the facts. So a moratorium gives us the people, the people out there to have the choice and the people to become informed about really what's going on. So as I understand the moratorium, what it would have forced the industry to do is that they need to prove um, you know, that what is happening to our land via these chemicals and pesticides and insecticides is actually good for our people. And if it's not, and if it's not, then I think we have a right as a people, as stewards of this place, as Hawaiians, especially of this place, to decide for ourselves, that's the consent, whether or not this is something we want for the future of our, our land. So to me, it's a real good, it's a real important step in the process. You know, instead of just making rash, crazy decisions either way, you know, it's really a step in the process to say, wait, let's become informed. Let's take responsibility. Let, more importantly, the, the people decide for themselves what is the kind of future that we want here. 
I support the GMO moratorium because I believe that everyone has a voice. I especially believe that Hawaiians have a voice and should get more involved in this issue by voting. I realize that many Hawaiians today feel politically disenfranchised because, because of our political situation, because many Hawaiians are pro-sovereignty and they feel like they don't want to vote because this is not their government. But I really believe that through this moratorium, through the vote, we have mana to influence something very important. One of the good things about this process is that if we rely on our decision makers and hope and pray that our decision makers make good decisions, and then we realize that maybe our legislators are not hearing us, yeah? to make for us to feel comfortable that good decisions are being made, right? Um, the process allows us, the people, the public, to have a say. It's a people's movement. You know, for me, it was just incredible and awe-inspiring to see 20,000 or so people participate in this process. That's the big chunk of this population. <laughs> we have very dismal turnout in um, our, our voter, you know, voter numbers um, in the nation. And then my wonderful um, district has the lowest in the state. But I believe that this has really woken up um, a whole demographic and different level of people to want to get involved. Are we going to say that those who are performing these kinds of acts upon our land should they be held responsible to provide us with accurate information first? You know, uh, as, as Dr. Lauren Pang uses the pre uh, precautionary principle, I think, is, the, is the, as I learned, is the language, which is that, you know, before you do anything, you have to prove that it's not going to be harmful. Unfortunately, these huge multinational agribusiness companies are, are doing things or performing these kinds of um, business ventures in Hawaii without really fulfilling that or answering that question. As a Hawaiian, my views never changed. Uh, I became a pro-independence uh, activist, pro-sovereignty activist, but I never stopped voting because, again, I believe that we have mana there, that we have a voice and we can still be pro independence, but use our money that we have now to vote and make a difference now. Well, the farming ban per se, I guess, that they're claiming to exist with this initiative um, isn't totally true in the sense that, because people are equating it to, oh my God, I can't have my lettuce growing in my backyard and I can't plant a, I can't have a papaya tree growing or I think someone mentioned the husband plants the tree and the wife waters it and now she's going to be arrested and fined too because she watered the plant and I, I mean it's just getting blown out of proportion. You know I've seen the the placards that the Maui Farm Bureau and all these other uh, uh, um, agribusinesses are trying to um, scare their scare tactics to the public about what's going to happen they can't farm this way and whatever i mean bro they get subsidy they get subsidy and they still fail yeah they get 13 million dollars subsidy and they're still struggling the only way they're going to make it make it yeah is by waiting and developing more land, yeah? But they can't do it farming the way they're farming. It goes down to, you know, organic farmers aren't affected and people who grow traditional conventional is not affected. And the primary concern is the 
huge chemical laden type crops that are surrounding us. And um, so to just generalize it as a farming ban, I believe it is not accurate in, in its statement. Proposed amendment by voter initiative to the Maui County Code. Voter initiative, genetically engineered organisms, should the proposed initiative prohibiting the cultivation or reproduction of genetically engineered organisms within the county of Maui, which may be amended or repealed as to a specific person or entity when required environmental and public health impact studies, public hearings, a two-thirds vote, and a determination by the county council that such operation or practice meets certain standards and which establishes civil and criminal penalties be adopted for Maui County. The wording on the ballot is quite confusing um, for me even when I first read it, but I, I know what it, the, in, the intent is and what it was meant to say. But for others who haven't been following as closely, I mean, as simple as I can put it is, people need to vote yes to say no. So all the families out there, all those who live in all the various Ahupua, all the various islands of Maui, all the different families, really we have no choice but to uh, commit ourselves. Why is it that 25, 26 plus other nations, countries, have told them no more. No more GMO, no more, you know, uh, over pesticiding our countries and got rid of them and got them out. These are successful agricultural producing countries yeah, that are able to show that they can still farm and do agriculture without killing the soil and tainting the water. Yeah, there are alternative ways. One way is through the natural farming process. Yeah. In South Korea, through the uh, uh, tutelage of a gentleman by, by the name of Master Cho, he has brought Korean natural farming methods not just to his Korean country, but to the global world. Encouraging agricultural growth through these methods. I've been fortunate to uh, uh, be educated in that style. And when I was first introduced to uh, this Korean natural farming method, uh, it made so much sense to me because this is the practice that my tutu was doing. It's just that the Hawaiians were doing it this way. And so for my introduction, it was more from a cultural practice, more from the spiritual practice. And the Korean natural farming way just crossed over and explained it to me from the scientific side. You know, when we were burying the fish heads into the ground, you know, uh, I, I was more from a cultural, spiritual practice, but now it was understanding the depth of the scientific side of introducing fish amino acids uh, to our plants. Uh, when we use the, the eggshells from the chickens uh, to, to, as a source of calcium, uh, their method of taking eggshells and transferring it and, and breaking it down, allowing a chemical reaction to take place so that we would then have water-soluble calcium. And the calcium we use then is to make your fruits and vegetables bigger. And the knowledge of our kupuna going to the ocean and using brackish water or ocean water and spraying it onto our plants, they too also do that practice to bring in uh, the various uh, mineral, trace mineral elements that's already in our ocean water. Yeah, so these are like such mineral elements as manganesium and iodine and iron and all that. So 
So, you know, we were, my understanding was able to just bridge and, and the application was, it was not nothing new. This is what our ancestors were doing. But today now it's allowed us to, to understand it on a, on a grander scale. And so we're now um, looking at following the examples of South Korea where they're doing natural farming on commercial level production, not just little gardens. You know, we're talking like thousand acre farms you know, and converting and growing healthy food. Uh, I've, my highest vision or the, yeah, my dream, I guess, has always been to make not just Maui Nui, but the state a um, role model for the rest of the world. I believe that we have every single thing um, here as in resources um, to, to get there. We have the you know, we have the mana'o, we have the history that shows and proves firsthand that we can be self-sufficient. I mean, we are the most rem remote <laughs> landmass on earth from any other. And we're little islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, yet thousands of years th these islands have sustained itself just fine and dandy without outside um, you know, influences and what have you. So to me, we have all the means for our renewable energy sources. We have abundance of water, which of course we know is life-giving to everything. We have our marine resources, but most of all, we have the people. We have the, um, you know, the, the Ike, the knowledge of the past that are still alive very well, which you can see in the voyaging canoe, the Hawaiians that navigated just by the moon, stars, and the sun, and by the celestial beings. And we have our ma'iai, the farmers. We have, you know, people like Alika, who getting back to the true roots, the indigenous, natural way of farming we utilize the sources that are here we don't need to bring something else it's already here in our land in our soils in our watersheds or what have you so the aulapa'au medicinal you know purposes are growing as i look out my window there's you know mountains of resources so that's truly, I think, in the end, why I do what I do. It's to get towards that goal of making the rest of the world look at us as a role model for them, for, for, for them to strive to, towards being, whether it's for, you know, renewable energy, food security, and, um, but the culture. I think the culture is something that aloha spirit that everyone comes to visit, yes, but something that I think everyone can benefit from by having a little bit of that in them to spread to their neighbors and into their infuse into their cultures and their lifestyle. So that I think is my ultimate ultimate goal. I went to college in the Midwest. I went to college out in Nebraska. A lot of my roommates, dorm mates, college classmates are all still farming, you know. Um, after my uh, involvement went on a Facebook, uh, a lot of them responded with me that they are guilty, you know, uh, for their style of farming and the introduction of not just the uh, GMOs, but also the pesticides and herbicides that they use daily. Some of my farmer friends in Nebraska had, had written back to me and they said, you know, they had dealt with um, uh, the super weeds, you know. You know, they said, oh, their tractors today in Nebraska are super big. Their sprayers are super big, yeah, to where their style of farming is just spray, yeah. Don't get off the tractor, just spray. But to fight this super weed, they had to get off the tractor and stop spraying 
and they had to go old school and cultivate, which was almost like hohana, yeah, to get rid of it. So it can be done to take care of the earth without spraying poison on it. And that's why I felt that uh, it is connected. This GMO situation is connected to our Hawaiian way of life. The vision that I hold for this island, for this place, for the Pai Aina o Hawaii, the, the island chain, is that we live pono. And what I mean by that is that we do look after everyone, um, whether it's health care or, you know, there's no political agendas. Everybody is living pono in a way that not just human beings are in sync, but humans are in sync with our environment. That's the old Hawaiian way, yeah? We lived with nature. We were aware of one another. We were aware of nature. Nature was aware of us. We lived in harmony. And I don't want to romanticize that, but it's something that can still be done today. If we stop doing things with money in mind, you know, if we stop the greed, if we think about each other and we think about the world we want to live in, we can follow the example of our ancestors, really, truly. And that's what I mean by live pono. Uh, for me, my push has been uh, two things, primarily. One, to lower our island's imports. And two, to look at uh, how to increase job and career opportunities for our, our own island people, especially those that choose not to be involved in the other industries of the island, such as tourism or government or, you know, uh, uh, in those arenas, you know, give our people choices uh, of other careers. And so I really believe that uh, the opportunities of natural farming and agriculture is there, yeah? With the recent closings of, of um, Wailuku Sugar and, and Maulan and Pine on the west side and Pioneer Mill Sugar out in Lahaina. Uh, these, these have allowed us to open up uh, not just hundreds, but thousands of agricultural acres, you know, for us to grow our own food, you know. So we must look at how can we grow our own food to feed our own people on this island. And so it starts with lowering our imports and growing our own food. And getting to the subject of value of growing our own food it is that's what security food security is all about that we all talk about. That's what the idea of being sustainable and being self-sufficient and all those catchphrases that everyone talks about, especially your politicians who want to get into office, that's some uh, key platforms that everyone talks about, yet we're still talking and I don't see it actually happening, you know, coming to fruition as quickly or as abundantly as I'd like to. And so it is extremely important and again, if I revert back to the practices of my ancestors and the Hawaiian people, there was over a million Hawaiians that lived in these islands with no barges and Costco's and big box stores. We, we were completely self-sufficient and it was with less, with no pesticides. It was with completely pure and natural, um, pristine environments from the, from Mauka to Makai. And that's what sustained everyone. Um, quite, everything was in balance and harmony with each other. It never took too much from one to give too much to another. And that went also for the Ahupua system where the Konohikis made sure that, you know, you produce this and you shared with another if they didn't have. And, and that was the whole cycle of life. And it was about yeah, giving and receiving, but yet never taking too much than, than needed. 
and I think this day and age, it we've become imbalanced because of the over abundant, you know, the the capitalist ideas, the the um, profit making, and 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 things of that nature, which truly my ancestors were not about that. We were here to malama, take care of what we have, and leave improve what we have or, or keep it in such a um, such a healthy form to where it's left for the future generations and a legacy so it's uh, extremely important for us to feed ourselves in a very healthy way though is where <laughs> what I'd like to see I had a natural farming workshop a, a few weeks back there are about 60 different farmers uh, came from all over Maui uh, they all came from about 12 different valleys. And the uh, interesting, interesting thing was that uh, the average age of a farmer on Maui is 60. In attendance in this natural farming workshop, the average age was 30. So it gave me great hope for the future of agriculture on Maui. Uh, with the interest of, of the young people wanting to commit uh, to feeding their people of, of their island. And so uh, I'm excited of what's going to be around the corner. But it also starts with uh, stopping, stopping this uh, genetic engineering activity and stopping the excessive uh, spraying of herbicides and pesticides on our land. And I, I strongly believe that we can do it and we can have a successful agricultural community that can do it naturally. Well, I think the issues for kids today are different from our issues. And I think that during the 70s, when I was growing up, we went through this Hawaiian Renaissance. We got our culture back. We got Kaholawe back. We got our Olelo back. And the only thing that remains is uh, our governance, our political control. So getting active in any issue that floats your boat, that lights your fire, is important. But I don't know what those issues are because I'm, you know, I'm on the wane. I'm getting older. And it's for the kids now to see, especially with the GMO issue, hey, this is a Hawaiian thing I can get involved in. Whether I'm just going to march, take part in a march, or I'm going to get out there, hold signs, or I'm going to testify at the legislature, do what you can do, you know, and find your passion. Find, if it's not GMO, maybe it's something else, but it's all tied together. So find whatever it is and just do it. Well, I think that a lot of the people in my generation, the, the kids and the students that are of my age and age range, aren't really educated on the, on the topic of GMO and pesticides and what's going into our foods. And I think that is an issue because later on in the future, there's not going to be people to carry on this knowledge, this mana'o, if you will. And we won't have people to fight for our rights and fight for our food and that kind of stuff. So we need to know what's going on because this won't just affect us. This is going to affect our grandchildren, our grandchildren's children. And we need to know what to do when issues like this happen in the future. And we need to be prepared now because when our kupuna passes away or, you know, everybody who's educated and great activists, when they leave, there's going to be nobody to tell the story and there's going to be nobody to carry on the fight. So that's um, an important, I think that's why students should get involved and should know the benefits or the health hazards of what's going on with GMOs today. I mean, that's why I'm here. Um, I'm in this seat to make the decisions that affect our future generations and the future generation are our youth today. And I believe that once they understand that the decisions we as ad adults or we um, make will ine inevitably affect their lives as 
they become adults. So it is their future. And I think the sooner, the earlier our keiki can understand that what we do is for them and that they too can, can build their futures, we can learn and build upon what it is that they want to see in their future, then that's the process and why they, it's important that they get involved and learn how to be involved and that their voices do matter. I think matter more than anything. I, I would love to see the youth involved in the political process because they are the ones who will carry us forward. They are our future and they need to get involved now. Student leadership is so important, but um, you know, they're involved with other things. They're concerned with going to college, hopefully, or you know, getting jobs. And sometimes they forget that they are here for Hawaii to take care of our environment, to take care of our people, to make it a safe place for future generations, just as others before them have done. Well, I just feel like, especially with, you know, the students in my generation, there's not enough of us that know about what's going on. I know I'm one of the most, I'm probably the only strong activist in my class. I know a lot of my friends know about what's going on because of me. And I know there's a couple, you know, there's some, I, I'm not saying I'm the only student activist. There's a lot of us out there, but there needs to be more. They think, in our generation, they think, oh, it's not our problem. We don't need to deal with it. We're only kids. Like, the adults can handle it. No, we're going to be the adults. We're going to be the next generation soon. And it's our kuleana to know what's going on, to be global, to know what's going on in today's society, so that when we get to that age, like I said, we, could, we know what to do, we know how to handle it, and we've been knowledgeable on this topic for a long time now. So I think it's just really important that the kids know what's going on now and to do their research too, just to be knowledgeable, be global. Looking back at the whole Save Honolulu Coalition movement, when we had testifiers come into the chambers, it was the youth. I'll guarantee anyone that it was the busloads of youth that had come into this chamber and testified and and poured out their their passion and their heartfelt feelings to all of us to the to the council members and at the time I looked around and all nine had tears in their eyes it was that moving it was that touching to think that an elementary child school child kid or you know, high school, they shouldn't be here having to beg and plead or about why you're going to take away this beautiful, you know, bay and beach and snorkel diving fishing area. And it was, yeah, it was real moving. It was, it was touching. And so um, the butts off the beach movement created by, you know, uh, some high school kids and that moved like wildfire. I mean, because when a child, how, who can say no to a, a child? I mean, the innocent, you know, young adults. So for me, it's very, very powerful and that it's important that we all as adults do educate them and make them realize that they matter, make them realize that they too can make a difference in this world at an early age but mainly because it is um, the future for, for themselves and their families. Well, every day I see the potential of students. Every year, so many students pass through my classroom, and I see that these are the kids who are going to run Hawaii someday. Kids, you have the power, you have the potential, you can be so influential in running this place, all you need to do is get involved, pay attention, maka'ala, and help others to get there too. We're counting on you. You are our future. Well, some of my like mentors or that inspired me to kind of fight for what is right, not only in GMOs, but just when we feel like our maybe individual rights are threatened or our land rights are threatened. Um, our, my tutu and my papa, Carl and Bridget Mawet, and my uncle Hawaii Mawet, Hawaii Loa Mawet, and Uncle Walter Riti, they, they all, all the Ritis 
have pushed really strong with the Koho Olave movement, the La'ao movement, the wind farming movements. And so far we've won. We've won the La'ao movement. We won the Koho Olave movement. So this is our next fight. And people say that there's no way Monsanto is too big, that they're too much of a great company. But that's what they said about Koho Olave in the bombings. Like, we fought against that and we prevailed and we succeeded. So I have no doubt that we won't be able to do this. So for all the people that say we, we are not strong enough, I beg to differ because we've done it in the past. So I think this is a fight that's worth standing for and it's something that we can do because like I said, we've done it before, we can do it again.